Hi, and welcome to the Optimal Nutrition for Cancer Survivors. My name is Christine Benjamin, and I'm the Breast Cancer Program Director at SHARE. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a 37-year-old nonprofit organization that helps people through breast or ovarian cancer, offering the unique support of survivors who've been there. Our services are free of charge and include helplines, support groups, educational programs, and public health initiatives. For more information about SHARE, you can visit our website at www.sharecancersupport.org. So let me tell you a little bit about, about the format and, and uh, how you can participate. So we'll start the program. We have a great presenter today. I'll introduce her in a couple of minutes. So we'll start with her presentation, and we'll ask you all to hold your questions and comments until the presentation is ended. You can submit questions through the question pane in your control panel, but we won't be able to answer them until after the presentation. Once the presentation's over, we'll take a look at your questions, and I will, I will ask the presenter your questions. You can type your questions in, in the space provided in your control panel, and you can raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon. That's also in your control panel. We have a lot of information, we have a lot of information to present today, so let me introduce our speaker, Jessica Ayanata. Jessica is currently responsible for all clinical operations at Meals to Heal, a complete solution to the needs of cancer patients evidence-based information, access to credentialed nutrition professionals, and affordable delivery of fresh, healthy, well-balanced meals. Prior to Meals to Heal, Jessica, went, Jessica spent over 10 years as both an inpatient and outpatient oncology dietitian, where she worked with a wide variety of cancer patients and was a valued member of the healthcare team. Jessica received a BS in nutrition food and ag agriculture from Cornell University. She completed her dietetic internship at New York Presbyterian Hospital while Cornell Medical Center and earned an MS in clinical nutrition from the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. She has a special interest in the role of nutrition and wellness in the prevention of chronic disease and cancer. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you, Christine, and I'm very happy to be a part of this webinar today. I know we've re already received several questions um, you guys sent along to the organizers, and I'm going to do my best to address them during the presentation, and we'll have plenty of time afterward to answer any questions that still remain. So today we're going to be talking about optimal nutrition for cancer survivors. So what are some of the things that might be on your mind? Having worked in oncology nutrition for many years, I know that many patients and survivors often struggle with weight gain as a result of their treatment. Perhaps they started treatment being at a higher weight than they would have desired, or they may have gained some weight during or after their treatment. Often, patients are also kind of confused because there's so much information out there and it's really hard to sort the fact from the fiction. What about soy? And I know that's a big one that a lot of people ask. What about dietary supplements or herbals or botanicals? What is the best diet, and how do I go about losing weight? So some important questions that people often consider. Is there a magic bullet or miracle food that can prevent cancer or prevent recurrence? And what can we do to help promote a healthy weight and possibly reduce our risk of cancer recurrence? Well, the best place that I always start is the American Institute for Cancer Research Nutrition Guidelines. First off, we want to be as lean as possible without becoming underweight. We want to be physically active. A good goal is at least 30 minutes every day. I know that's not necessary, necessarily feasible for everyone, but if you find small ways to fit it in, that's a great way to increase your physical activity. Avoiding sugary drinks, essentially the empty calories, things that don't give us added nutrition. So we want to limit our consumption of energy-dense foods that don't give our bodies any benefit. And of course, this is my favorite. Eat more variety of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and legumes such as beans. 
all of the healthy plant foods that have so many cancer-fighting properties. And we'll go into more detail in a little while. Limit consumption of red meats. This includes beef, pork, and lamb. And avoid processed meats. And if consumed at all, it's very important to limit alcoholic drinks. Two per day for men and only one a day per women. And we'll go through serving sizes in a moment. And you want to limit your consumption of salty foods and foods processed with sodium, essentially all the unhealthy foods that we know aren't good for us. Most importantly, and I know this is a big question for a lot of people, it is not recommended that you use supplements to protect against cancer. A good, healthy, well-balanced diet is always the best place to start, and we're going to go through some ways to do this today. So first off, as I mentioned, one of those guidelines was limiting alcoholic beverages. Well, the current research shows that women who drink one alcoholic beverage or more per day may have a small increase in risk. Those who in, in actually drink more than this can actually increase their risk even greater, especially if you're someone who has an estrogen-sensitive cancer or a hormone-sensitive cancer. It's important to use caution with alcohol because there have actually been clear studies that have linked alcohol consumption. So what is a serving? As I mentioned earlier, no more than one serving per day is what is recommended by the American Institute for Cancer Research. So one serving is 12 ounces of beer, 6 ounces of wine, or an ounce and a half of hard liquor. It's actually only an ounce of hard liquor if it's over 100 proof. So what is important to take away from this? If you're somebody who's, let's say, drinking alcohol moderately once in a while at a social occasion, Chances are that should be fine. But if it's something you do more regularly, I would definitely recommend that you speak to your health care team, your health care team about ways that you can go about making an appropriate action plan to limit it appropriately. And just remember this guideline and remember the serving sizes that above this amount is not recommended. One thing you can do, and for someone who includes alcohol, let's say intermittently during a social occasion or a celebration, a helpful thing is to include folate-rich foods in your diet. And the reason for this is because alcohol can interfere with folate metabolism. So it's important to replace this through your diet. So some folate-rich foods that are really easy to include include things like bananas, oranges and tomatoes, dark leafy greens, legumes and lentils, fortified cereals. Most cereals are actually fortified with folic acid, which is the supplemental form and then a general multivitamin or a lot of you know kind of general basic dietary supplements will contain the bare minimum of 400 micrograms of this folic acid and that's something that if your physician let's say advises you to do or feels that it's appropriate for you to take that's also another way in supplemental form as well okay so another big kind of clear message in the AICR guidelines that we just were going through earlier is achieving and maintaining a healthy weight. And one thing people often ask me is, well, how do I know? What is a healthy weight? So there are some ways we can define kind of your weight status and how to achieve a healthy weight. First off, we consider an ideal body weight. An ideal body weight for a woman is 100 pounds at 5 foot tall, and then you add 5 pounds for every inch over that. Now, take note that there is some account of frame size in this measurement here. So if you're somebody who has, let's say, a larger frame size, it's 10% above that and 10% below that if you're a smaller frame size. So there is kind of some, some range that you have for an ideal body weight. But that's not necessarily always ideal for everyone. So there is another really helpful measurement, and I know you've probably all seen this in a chart in your doctor's office, is the body mass index, better known as your BMI. So a really easy way to calculate your BMI, you take your weight in pounds and multiply it by 700, and then you divide it by your height in inches squared. So when you get that number, you can even actually find BMI calculators online or in an app for your iPhone or your iPad. Um, when you get that number of your BMI, this is how you figure out kind of where it falls. A BMI of 19 to 25 is considered a healthy weight. A BMI over 25 is considered overweight. And a BMI over 30 is actually considered obese. So, um, you know, kind of based on where your BMI falls in and kind of where your ideal, ideal body weight falls, you can kind of see, you know, where your health goals may need to be in terms of weight management. 
another useful kind of non-technical way to determine um, kind of body weight and shape is to look at kind of your body shape. So we have kind of two different class classifications that we usually use in terms of shape. There's a typical apple shape where there's a larger distribution of body fat that's in the abdominal area. And then you have your kind of classic pear shape where a larger distribution of your body fat is in your hip and thigh area. So it's known that apple shapes can have a higher risk of, of many different chronic diseases simply because of that fat distribution in the abdominal area where all of your major organs are. That fat is in a much unhealthier area than for a pear shape. So how do you kind of make sense of this all and what does it all mean? Well, one thing I do want to stress is I don't want you to get too caught up in numbers and shapes and all of that. First off, the formulas don't take into account lean body mass. So if you're somebody who is very active and has a lot of muscle mass, your BMI may actually be slightly higher simply because of that. And it doesn't take into account all of the beneficial physical activity that you may do as well. So we don't say that we use it as a sole predictor of your health status, but it's a really important tool. And I think it's a great tool if you're looking to make some healthy changes and healthy goals toward weight management because it gives you a place to start and it gives you a place to know, OK, where does my goal need to be and where should I aim? Where should I aim my BMI to be and what's a good health and weight goal for me? So how does this all fit kind of in relation to breast cancer and relation to other cancers? The theory is hormones are stored in our body fat tissue. So if you're someone who has a history of a hormone sensitive cancer, albeit a breast cancer or an ovarian cancer, with a greater percentage of body fat, potentially you have a higher level of estrogen storage. So these higher estrogen levels can potentially increase risk. So that's why it's so important to try to achieve and maintain a healthy body weight. So now that we've kind of given the framework of why a healthy weight is so important, now I'm going to give you some, some good tips, some good nutrition tips and diet tips on how to achieve a healthy weight and some easy changes that you can make in your diet to kind of move toward that great goal. First off, a really kind of easy tip and a really easy framework that we often position um, you know, good healthy weight loss is to try to increase your dietary fiber and lower the fat in your diet. Kind of two easy things to remember. And it's definitely two things that most people are aware of and have you know, read about or tried or, or talked about or you know, had somebody recommend to them at some point or another. What we mean by high fiber is we want to aim for 25 to 35 grams per day. It sounds like a lot, but it's actually not when you include the right amount of whole grains and fruits and vegetables, which we'll talk about in a moment. The average American really only eats about 10 grams of fiber per day, which is, as you see, less than half of the goal. So this is a really important component of a good, healthy weight management and cancer-fighting diet, simply because A, fiber, and a lot of the high-fiber foods have good cancer-fighting properties, and B, higher fiber foods can help you feeling fuller longer. So they actually help you to prevent you from overeating and kind of being in that situation where you really are tempted to eat more than you need to. What you want to do is choose mostly whole grains or complex carbohydrates, and we'll go into more detail. Avoid simple carbohydrates and empty calories and kind of cookies, cakes, candies, sugars, things like that. When we talk about lower fat, we're talking about lowering our total fat intake. And as most of you have probably been aware of, fat has twice as many calories as carbohydrates and protein do. So by, simply by lowering your fat content, it's very easy to slim down on the calories. Choose lean proteins. That's really important because high fat meats and things like that can definitely contribute to your fat intake. Avoiding the unnecessary added fats, which we'll go through in a moment. And choosing more low fat and non-fat dairy products. And being very mindful of the hidden sources of fat in your diet. So kind of to, to review the sources of complex carbohydrates that I mentioned earlier. It comes from things like grains, cereals, breads, and nuts and beans. So some good examples for, in the grain group would be things like 
bulgur, choosing brown rice versus white rice, choosing whole wheat pasta versus the regular pasta, choosing alternative grains, things like kasha, millet, or even quinoa, things that may be kind of outside of your norm, but that can add extra good sources of whole grain. When looking at cereals, one important thing that I always recommend is to try to read the food label. The food label is really going to be your key to telling you what is in this food and is it really good for me. So when you're looking at the dietary fiber content of your cereals, you want to aim for at least five grams of dietary fiber per serving. So some cereals that are usually good sources are things like bran flakes, kashi, muesli, whole grains, cereals, whole oats. Um, these are better cereals to choose than things like just kind of plain, you know, Cheerios or things that may just be simple. They're definitely low fat, but they're not really high sources of dietary fiber. If you're somebody who doesn't really like the fiber cereals, a lot of times people complain to me, well, they taste like cardboard. They're not that appetizing. So a good recommendation that I usually suggest is to try and maybe add half and half. So maybe add half of a portion, let's say, of the bran flakes to your favorite cereal. And at least that's a good way to start getting more fiber in your diet. In terms of breads, you want to aim for at least three grams of dietary fiber per serving, usually a serving is a slice, choosing things like whole wheat bread, multigrain breads, rye, and pumpernickel. Now, it is important to remember that because whole grain and the word whole wheat, whole grain has become so popular, it's actually not a regulated term. So you can buy in the store you know, a whole grain white bread, but yet it's still white bread and it still doesn't have that much fiber. They may add supplemental fiber to make it look healthy, but essentially it's really not a good whole grain bread. So you're better off looking for 100% whole grain. Make sure the first ingredient is at least one of these grains to ensure that you're getting a really good source. And then, of course, legumes and nuts. Maybe these are things that people don't add as often. Um, but they are actually also a very good source of dietary fiber. So a good rule of thumb is a portion is usually about the size of your palm or one to two ounces. So this includes all types of beans, red beans, kidney beans, chickpeas, lentils, and a variety of unsalted nuts, almonds, walnuts, Brazil nuts, whatever may be your favorite. The one thing I usually suggest is that make sure you A, buy unsalted nuts and don't buy the roasted kind because they chances are have extra oil and ingredients added to them that kind of take away their healthful properties. So plain nuts are always the best. And in terms of beans, canned is an option, but it is important that you rinse it very well because obviously canned beans can come along with more sodium. Um, and it's not something that you really want to add to your diet because you're adding a healthful ingredient. So try to make it as healthy as possible. Soaking beans overnight is always a good option. I know it's a lot of work for some people. There are some quick ways you can soak beans in pressure cookers um, and kind of boiling them a little bit first before you soak them. So there are some easy ways you can include things like that as well. So as you're increasing your dietary fiber, um, I'm sorry, let me go back here for a second. As you're increasing your dietary fiber, one thing I do want to point out is that you don't want to do so all at once. So you don't want to kind of switch everything overnight because in doing so, you may alter your digestive system a little too quickly and you can actually experience kind of more constipation as a result. It's very important to introduce and increase dietary fiber a little bit more slowly and also make sure you drink plenty of fluids at the same time because if you're not drinking enough, all that fiber, you know, essentially if you think of it, can kind of get stuck. Um, you want to give it enough um, lubrication by drinking enough fluid to kind of move through your digestive system and keep you regular. Okay, so that other big um, kind of key component that we talked about earlier or, or I started to introduce earlier was lowering your fat intake. So we talked about choosing lean proteins. So how do we do that? First off, the dairy group is obviously a, a big source of protein in our diet. So you do want to make sure to choose non-fat or skim milk only and choose only low-fat, non-fat cheeses and low-fat or non-fat yogurts. And I know a question came through um, before the presentation related to dairy and, and cancer. And I know 
you know, that's, that's often a question that comes up. Unfortunately, specifically to dairy, there isn't any clear-cut evidence to say for sure that, you know, dairy, let's say, is going to increase risk of breast cancer. Um, ultimately, what I recommend to my patients is that um, if you're somebody who, you know, consumes the usual two to three servings of dairy per day and you're choosing the lower fat, non-fat versions, you're avoiding the, the dangerous component, which is the, the saturated fat that's in these foods. If you feel very strongly that dairy is not something that agrees with you, whether you're lactose intolerant or it's kind of your individual personal decision, whether you're um, kind of moving toward um, some vegan components of your diet, there all, are also some great dairy alternatives, soy milk, rice milk, almond milk, and all of their components. There's coconut-based yogurts and things that um, still have the great sources of calcium. Um, but are a good alternative to the dairy food. So just to kind of help give you some guidance on that concern that, that was addressed before the presentation. So another source of lean protein is our meat group. So I always recommend when choosing meats to try to choose the breast if possible. So white meat, chicken and turkey, lean pork. Believe it or not, the dark meat has two to three times more fat than the white meat version. So, you know, kind of looking toward replacing some um, recipes instead of using ground beef, perhaps try to use ground turkey, even substitute it with the recipe with half ground turkey, um, and use, you know, maybe a, a recipe that you would have normally used a dark meat chicken, try to replace it with a white meat chicken marinating meats ahead of time, because I know, you know, people are often concerned, well, you know, the, the chicken and turkey breasts are often kind of dry, so it's helpful if you marinate it ahead of time, and that can actually make it a lot more moist, similar to their darker counterpart, counterparts. Another good source of lean pr protein is obviously fish. Um, not a lot of people eat fish as often as they should. A great goal is to eat fish two to three times per week. And that's a very good, high-quality lean protein. And limiting red meat to less than twice per week is usually the goal that I recommend. And as we saw earlier, the American Institute for Cancer Research also resonates this recommendation in terms of red, limiting red meat for cancer prevention. So when we're talking lowering fat, those are some of the basic ways you can do so with your diet. But we, we now want to kind of give you some guidance on how to choose the right kind of fats. Because you probably hear lots of terms thrown around these days. Saturated fat, unsaturated fat, you know, kind of how do you know how to make sense of it all. So first off, what we want to do is we do want to focus on our unsaturated fats. These are the fats that have more heart-healthy properties. So they include omega-3 fatty acids. These are our polyunsaturated fats that have good heart-healthy properties and good anti-inflammatory properties. So we want to consume more fish, so especially fatty fish like salmon and tuna and mackerel are really rich in omega-3 fatty acids. It's important to choose the wild versions because often farm-raised fish does not contain really much omega-3 at all because it's fed very differently. Then you also have nuts, things like walnuts, flax seeds, canola oil. Even some people you know, aim to get omega-3 fatty acids through fish oil supplementation. So there's lots of different ways that you can incorporate more omega-3 fat into your diet. Another unsaturated fat is our monounsaturated fats. So this comes from things like olive oil, which I know is a, often a staple in, in most people's homes, um, avocados, canola oil nuts and seeds as well. So a good source of monounsaturated fat from the nut group is actually your almonds. So if you're someone who's maybe looking to add more healthy fat, a great way would be maybe to add some shaved almonds or some crushed walnuts, you know, to a salad, to a stir fry or something like that. You know, and in a small portion it's a great way to fit good healthy fat but not too many calories. Another unsaturated fat that we do want to be a little more mindful of is our omega-6 fats. And the reason for this is that omega-6 fats, as compared to omega-3, can potentially be more inflammatory type of fat. So we do want to reduce our intake of omega-6 fats, which is not hard to do if we stay away from kind of all of the unhealthy processed stuff, things like crackers, cookies, chips, baked goods, 
anytime you see um, you know those kind of foods with lots of hydrogenated oils, these are going to contain more omega-6 fats from the less healthy oils. And of course, eating less saturated fat. We all know that saturated fat is known as, a, you know, AKA the bad fat. Um, this is the fat that's known to clog our arteries um, and be, you know, unhealthy. So very easy because if we stay away from all the stuff that you know we all know is not very helpful, fast foods, full fat dairy products, poultry skin, the darker meats, tropical oils, things like palm oil. These are really high sources of saturated fats. So if we try to minimize these foods, choose more of the healthful unsaturated fats that we reviewed above, that's a great way to kind of improve the balance of your, of your fat in your diet. OK, so now that we've talked about some dietary components that can assist in achieving and maintaining a good healthy weight, Another key component is physical activity. So why is physical activity so important? First off, it can help to strengthen the immune system, which is definitely very important as a cancer survivor because you want to maintain a good, strong immune system to help your body recover, heal, and stay strong. One thing that people may not realize is physical activity also improves digestion. So by keeping active, you're helping to keep yourself regular. And a lot of times after cancer treatment, whether it's been a year or five years, you may still have some lingering issues with indigestion. So simply by being more active can actually help to improve that. Of course, we all know physical activity can burn calories. So it's helping to control weight and enhance weight loss for those who are looking to lose weight healthfully. And physical activity for those who, who have a history of hormone-sensitive cancers can actually also help to decrease your hormone levels. So that's another really, really important benefit. What I always like to point out in terms of physical activity is that it's important to get cardiovascular activity, meaning getting your heart pumping, getting your body moving. But it's also helpful to also work your muscles and improve your body mass. And that's through resistance exercise. And the reason for that is by building body mass in a safe manner, you can actually help to increase your metabolism that way. So if you're somebody who's looking to, let's say, achieve a healthier weight, not only taking that walk or maybe taking a jog or doing, um, you know, let's say, spin at the local gym, that's important. But it's also important to not be afraid, let's say, to meet with a personal trainer and try to get a good regimen with some weight exercises because the combination of both has shown to be, of, you know, have maximum success in terms of weight loss. So what is the recommendation for physical activity? The American Cancer Society recommends 150 minutes total of moderate physical activity or 75 minutes of vigorous physical activity spread throughout the week. So it sounds like a lot. I know that that number 150 does sound quite high, but the important thing to recognize is that the recommendation is that it's spread throughout the week. So as long as you can try to find easy and achievable ways to fit small amounts of activity in your day, um, typical, you know, park your car a little bit extra farther in the parking lot, or maybe start taking the stairs at work. Or now that we finally have, you know, some nice weather and spring is upon us, um, it would be great to try to maybe take a walk during the lunch break, maybe in the evenings, um, either before or after dinner time, take a walk, a brisk walk at a local park or around your neighborhood. So it's a great time of year to really work on some good physical activity goals. You know, and oftentimes in anticipation of the summer and bathing suit season, a lot of gyms will offer discounted memberships during, you know, spring and summertime. So it might also be a good time to you know, join the gym and get a good discount, maybe get some free training sessions with a, somebody who can get you started on a good regimen. So um, it's a good time of year to maybe work on some more physical activity goals. And of course, all of this is, is um, kind of in the context of your own individual needs. So we want to make sure that you do so under the, you know, recommendation and approval of your medical team. You know, we want to make sure that you also 
are healthy enough to begin physical activity. So of course, always obtain the approval of your physician and medical team before you start anything new in terms of physical activity. Okay, so another big recommendation, and as I mentioned earlier, this is one of my favorites, is the benefits of the, of the plant foods. And the American Institute for Cancer Research, one of their main, main staples is what we call a plant-based diet. A plant-based diet doesn't necessarily mean that you automatically have to become vegetarian and remove all meat from your diet. What it means is that if you're trying to choose more plant foods from fruits, vegetables, grains, beans, nuts, and seeds, all of these plant foods have numerous cancer-fighting properties that we're going to review at, um, actually right now. One of those very important cancer-fighting properties is the phytochemicals that are in fruits and vegetables. What I like to call fruits and vegetables are the best nutritional package. So if you think of kind of the nutritional value of the, the foods that are available in our diet, one of the best nutritional packages comes from our plant foods because they're full of fiber, phytochemicals, vitamins and minerals, antioxidants, and all sorts of disease-fighting properties. So phytochemicals are plant chemicals that are naturally found in fruits and vegetables. And they actually help destroy carcinogens in our body before they can actually damage our healthy cells. So phytochemicals are really, really important. And the more color and the more variety we try and include in our diet, the more exposure and the more we can benefit from these phytochemicals in our foods. A great way that I like to think of your body in, in, in relation to these phytochemicals and antioxidants, which I'm going to mention in a moment, if you think of your body like a nice, clean, crisp, white tailored shirt, and you've got a stain on that shirt, you would want to launder it and take care of it as quickly as possible so that you keep the shirt nice and clean. So if you think of your body similarly, you want to use the right detergent to also cleanse your body and keep your body healthy. And the phytochemicals and antioxidants in these plant foods do exactly the same thing. They help to cleanse our body from damage. So as I mentioned, the antioxidants are also found in fruits and vegetables. And these actually protect our body from what's called free radicals. These are byproducts of natural metabolic processes, as well as external and environmental things like smoking, exhaust from cars, and fumes, and things like that. So we're exposed to free radicals each and every day. We know that they potentially have a role in, as a cancer-causing agent, but if we have a diet that's rich in antioxidants, these antioxidants naturally help neutralize these free radicals from becoming dangerous to our body. So how do you know the best fruits and vegetables to choose? Well, actually, the answer is that all fruits and vegetables contain potential cancer-fighting phytonutrients. And we really want to aim for variety. Um, we like to think of it kind of as eating the rainbow choosing a variety of colors to ensure that you're including the full spectrum of phytochemicals and antioxidants that your body may need. So usually what we recommend for cancer prevention is 8 to 10 servings per day. Now I know that may sound like a lot, but it's actually not that much when we talk about what a serving is. So if we say about 2 to 4 servings of fruit, 4 to 7 servings of vegetables, one serving is actually a small apple. If you're even, even if you're eating a larger apple, that's actually two servings right there. Half a cup of chopped fruit, a cup of lettuce, half a cup of berries. Um, even you know, if you're sprinkling, let's say, some vegetables and having a salad for lunch or dinner, um, that's a great way to include at least two to three servings right there. So it's actually not that hard to achieve that number. Um, but I know it can be overwhelming, especially if you're not someone who's used to eating a lot of fruits and vegetables. Um, and it's also, it can be, I know, overwhelming. I know one question that came in earlier was, you know, how do you go about fitting in all these, these good cancer-fighting foods? Because especially if you're someone who's not really used to eating them, and oftentimes it's a little extra work, you know, cleaning, cutting, chopping. Well, usually a suggestion that I recommend is, 
it's okay to choose a more convenient version because these foods are still healthy. So if you're someone who doesn't have a lot of time, let's say, to get home and chop all the vegetables to make a salad for lunch, it's okay to buy, let's say, baby carrots or maybe some mushrooms that have to happen to be pre-sliced or um, a package of lettuce that's pre-washed. That's okay because those still have good cancer-fighting nutrients and it's helping you to achieve more um, in your diet and that they're still beneficial. So you don't necessarily have to do everything from scratch. And believe it or not, frozen fruits and vegetables are a really great option as well. And a lot of times people kind of consider frozen equivalent with convenience and don't really assume that that's healthy, but frozen fruits and vegetables actually can retain more nutrition than their fresh counterparts because they're flash frozen very soon after they're picked and, and they maintain their ripe quality that way and, and uh, maintain their nutritional values. So, you know, rather than going home after a long day of work and chopping broccoli and washing it and trying to make, let's say, a stir fry, it's perfectly acceptable to also, you know, choose something like a frozen package of broccoli and, and use that for a stir fry as well. And that's a great way to get in more, more vegetables. So, um, you know, there are some helpful shortcuts that can still give you uh, plenty of good nutrition. So this slide is, is not meant to be confusing by any means. It's just meant to show you how important, you know, these plant chemicals, these phytochemicals, and antioxidants, what we call bioactive, meaning they're active in your body, food components, and how many processes related to cancer that they can affect. Um, this is, uh, you know, just visually, you can see how important these foods are in terms of having um, really important cancer-fighting properties. Okay, so another big component of the AICR guidelines, and it was the last one that we spoke of at the bottom of the list, and that was not using supplements to protect against cancer. And the way I like to frame this is, as a cancer survivor, you want to make sure to make educated decisions when you're choosing food supplements and evaluating the latest food trends. And the reason for this is because there's always going to be something that's the latest and the greatest that you're going to read on the internet or that a friend is going to tell you about or somebody's going to forward to you, oh my goodness, you have to start eating this magical berry or you know, eat, add more flax or make sure to stay away from this or that you know, there's always going to be something that's going to be drawn to your attention. And you want to take a step back and make sure that you're looking at it from a, a point of view where you're making an educated decision and also evaluating it with the right evidence and with the assistance of your healthcare team to know that you're kind of examining it from the right perspective and you have the right information with which to make a decision. Because there's a lot of false information out there and a lot of misleading information as well. So one hot topic that obviously comes up often um, with my patients and, and in various groups and, and talks that I've done is, is the soy and cancer topic. So the reason why soy gets so much attention is because soy in itself contains a phytoestrogen, which means it's a plant estrogen. So it's one of those plant chemicals, those phytochemicals that we mentioned earlier, that's similar in shape and structure to human estrogen. So it may actually compete with human estrogen to help prevent cancer. The reason why there's so much confusion um, and, it, and it comes up so frequently is because there were earlier concerns that soy could potentially increase cancer recurrence in hormonal breast cancers. But the good news, and that a lot of people, and especially a lot of healthcare professionals, don't necessarily um, know about the more recent studies and evidence that has come out on soy. The research up to date has actually demonstrated that in moderate amounts, one to two servings per day, soy intake from whole foods is actually safe. And we're going to go through kind of what a serving is and a little bit more research on this. So why are these phytoestrogens kind of so noteworthy? Why do people um, even kind of pay attention to things like soy? Well, it's interesting because what we've noticed is that rates of colon, breast, and prostate cancers are actually much lower in Asian countries where soy is a major staple of their diet. 
So Asian women have about one-fifth of the rate of breast cancer as Amer American women, which is actually quite significant. And what we find is that when, if they move to the U.S., they develop an increasing incidence of a Western-type cancer, which can include breast cancer and, and some of the cancers we mentioned above, within one to two generations. So they're kind of removed from that lifestyle that involves a lot of um, natural soy as part of their diet. So is it possible that the phytoestrogens in soy are responsible for this? Well, it's interesting because the mean daily soy intake is 10 to 50 grams in Asia and only 1 to 3 grams in the United States. And estrogen levels are 40% lower in Asian populations. So what might be really important with kind of these facts is that likely it's really key at what point in life the body is exposed to phytoestrogens. So because Asian women grow up with soy throughout their lifestyle during childhood and adolescence, it may be that during the period when the breast tissue is developing and during adolescence before any mutational step can occur in the breast tissue that the soy has this maximum benefit. So kind of how do you put that all into perspective in terms of the decision that, that you or your family member or loved one should make about soy? I always recommend that it's important when you're considering, a, considering any food that has any controversy whatsoever associated with it, that it's important for you as an individual to discuss it with your physician or your registered dietitian or your healthcare team. What is your stage of cancer and what is your hormonal status? Do you have a strong family history? And what is your particular diet involved in terms of prior soy intake? It's not necessarily something that you have to add drastically just because we know now that it's safe because a drastic change in your diet isn't necessarily recommended either. Do you have good general diet and exercise habits? What is your weight history? And what is your menopausal status? Often you'll see soy as a component of a lot of menopausal type supplements simply because of its phytoestrogenic properties. Potentially it's you know, touted to have benefit in reducing some kind of menopausal symptoms like hot flashes and things like that. So that's another place where you want to be careful because that's not necessarily a reason to add soy to your diet. And often those supplemental forms, which can be in a pill or a powder or um, a shake, those are the isolated soy proteins. They're not in the whole natural food form, and those may not be in a form that's actually beneficial or safe for you to take. So what is considered a serving of soy? Whole soy foods like soybeans, half a cup, roasted soybeans or a quarter of a cup, soy milk is one cup, soy yogurt also a cup, soy cheeses, you can have an ounce, soy flour, which sometimes is used in various recipes, is a quarter of a cup, and things like tempeh, which is a soy, um, a soy food alternative is half a cup. So what, one thing that you want to do, um, tofu as well, and included in the tempeh. One thing you do want to do, as I mentioned, is avoiding any supplements, powders, any unnatural forms. And you do want to limit the highly processed forms, which contain a lot of sodium, um, things like soy burgers, soy nuts, veggie burgers, and things like that. Not to say that, you know, once in a while, if you're someone who's a vegetarian, it may be appropriate for you. You know, that's an individual decision. but. In general, when you're considering appropriate servings, we really like to consider whole soy foods as having the, um, the appropriate benefit in your diet. Okay. So when we think about kind of guidelines for optimal nutrition to kind of put together everything that we've talked about today, I think one thing you can notice on this slide is that there's lots of different colors, lots of different variety. Um, and you'll see, you know, maybe maybe you'll see a food on here that, hmm, you know what, I don't eat that too often, but that is something that I should maybe try to eat more often. You see the beans, you see asparagus, you see fish. Um, we want to aim for a variety. We want to aim for a color because that's the best way to start a good cancer-fighting diet. So, and another really kind of important fact to take away from this as well is, as you saw on that slide, there were lots of different healthy foods pictured. So. 
when we talk about a good cancer-fighting diet and a good diet for weight loss and weight management, it comes down to more than just one food. It's actually your whole eating pattern and your whole lifestyle that's really vital for your own success. If you want to promote a healthy weight, if you want to look toward adding some good healthy foods for cancer prevention to prevent recurrence as a survivor, you want to kind of take a step back and make some really simple, easy goals that you can work on toward improving your diet. Maybe it's adding an extra serving of fruits and vegetables every day. And maybe for you something you can take away is, you know what, I do eat a little more red, red meat than I should. Maybe that's something that you want to cut down a little bit and add more lean protein. So for each and every one of you, I know there's something that probably kind of set a light bulb off in your head today. And I think that's probably the best place for you to start. You know, maybe even the physical activity piece of it. You know, you happen to just get that postcard in the mail, you know, advertising, let's say, the, the latest and greatest deal at the local gym, and you, you say, you know what, maybe now's the time for me to get more active. So there's lots of different pieces to this puzzle, and I would recommend, you know, kind of start with something achievable and that makes the most sense for you. What I don't want you to do is make the mistake of really focusing on just one food. So. I want you to really take in the importance of this variety and balance and moderation that we've, we've focused on today. If you focus too much on just one food, you know, a lot of times, like I mentioned, you'll get an email about, you know, this latest and greatest uh, acai berry, let's say, or, you know, the noni fruit or something that has come up as, you know, touted as great cancer-fighting food. A lot of times if you focus too much on one food and adding that to your diet, you kind of miss out on making sure the rest of your diet is as healthy as, healthy as it should be. And that's really the most in place, important, important place to start. So before even considering anything new and different, the best place to start is with the actual healthy foundation of your diet and your, life, and your lifestyle. Because if you focus too much on one thing, you, you really miss out on the benefits and the importance of all those other key components. So let's review some good techniques for a healthy cancer-fighting diet. So first off, we talked about limiting alcohol consumption to one or less drink per day. And like I said, individual goals can be discussed with between you and your healthcare team. Maintaining a healthy weight by limiting intake of high fat foods, especially those of animal origin, things like choosing things like lean proteins and lower fat dairy products like we talked about, and also making sure to aim toward more healthy fats and less of the unhealthy fats. Choosing more of the high fiber, phytonutrient rich whole grains, beans, and legumes, increasing your fiber intake has those numerous benefits that we talked about. Keeping you feeling fuller longer, helping to improve your digestion, and also giving you lots of good cancer-fighting properties. Increasing your intake of healthy fats, so more uh, plain, unsalted, unroasted nuts and seeds, and trying to choose more fish two to three times per week if possible. And as I mentioned, remember wild fish is always a little bit more beneficial, especially because of the fact that farmed fish is not always fed the same, you know, natural diet that it is that a wild fish is consuming in their, their natural environment. Including regular physical activity. So making small goals. You don't have to run a marathon. We want you to just get moving. Really like that, that campaign, you know, through, um, through the government that let's move campaign, really that's kind of how you want to think of it. You want to find fun, desirable, and unique ways for you as an individual to get your body moving and increase your daily physical activity. And then aiming for 8 to 10 servings of vegetables and fruits per day of varying colors. And as I, as I mentioned, that rainbow, that spectrum of colors is what's really important to get in the variety of phytochemicals and antioxidants that help your body to fight disease and fight cancer. 
And then when we put all, put all that in per, into perspective and we make sure that the foundation of our diet is really healthy, that's where we need to start. Before we even consider any kind of supplement or latest food trend, we want to make sure that the foundation of our diet is healthy and well-balanced and includes a variety of good cancer-fighting foods. And then you want to take that information, make an educated decision when you're evaluating the latest and greatest supplement and food trend. You know, use your resources. We actually have on our website, on the Meals to Heal website, we have a great um, nutrition resources tab where you can actually access the Natural Standard Database, which is a database that's often um, subscription-based, but we actually have free access on our website where you can search for any kind of dietary supplement, herb, or botanical, and kind of get really evidence-based, solid scientific information as to whether or not it's considered safe or even something you should remotely consider before discussing with your healthcare team. And the same thing with food trends. You want to make sure to remember that word trend. Oftentimes, these latest and greatest fad diets, whether it's the paleo diet or the belly fat diet or you know things that come out, are often just a trend. Really, when it comes down to a good cancer-fighting diet, what I always like to say is it's always back to basics. Good, healthy nutrition is really the best place to start. So hopefully, I've given you a lot of food for thought today. And um, I look forward to a lot of good questions as well. So I know um, Christine's probably been gathering questions throughout uh, the presentation. And we can get started. Great. OK, first question. I heard that cancer cells love sugar. Should carbs be limited because carbs turn to sugar? Can you just speak to that in general? Sure. That's actually probably in the top five list of questions that I, that I get asked quite often. So um, I, I know that there's a lot of attention. Sugar gets a lot of attention in terms of cancer. But the way we, we kind of want to take a step back. Believe it or not, sugar feeds all cells in our body. So whether it's a cancer cell or a healthy cell, the, the sugar and our body needs glucose for energy. So that energy is going to be supplied to any cell in our body. The key component is that from an overall health perspective, what we don't want to do is to set off the balance in our diet and choose unhealthy foods, really energy dense, empty calories, high sugar foods that are going to increase our body's production of insulin. Because it's not that there's a direct relationship between sugar and cancer. That's not the answer. The answer is that a really high sugar diet, somebody who's, let's say, eating lots of soda, cakes, cookies, candies, all things that we know we shouldn't be eating, the body responds by producing a lot of insulin to get the glucose or the sugar into our cells. And that's where the issue lies, is that if your body is producing a lot of insulin chronically from a really high sugar diet, that insulin can potentially put your body in a more um, kind of cancer-friendly environment that may promote growth. So there's, like I said, there's no direct relationship. It's more that it's a, a really sensationalized way of saying the bottom line is that we should really eat healthy and try to stray away from really high sugar foods and foods that don't have any added nutritional value to our bodies because essentially there's no benefit to them whatsoever. Now. People often say, well, well I want to eat a birthday cake, you know, birthday cake on my birthday, and I want to enjoy ice cream in the summertime. And the key is, here is moderation. So no one's saying that by having that bowl of ice cream once in a blue moon or enjoying a birthday cake, a piece of birthday cake on your birthday, no one's saying at all that any of those foods are going to be harmful to you and your body. The key is moderation. So kind of take away the point that I mentioned is that the issue is when somebody has a diet that's excessively high in these foods, where there's no balance, there's no real, you know, kind of healthy balance to their diet. So the key is moderation, avoiding the unnecessary sweets in your diet, things that you may not even realize. You know, maybe you like to drink iced tea at lunchtime, but you realize, you know what, it, it's sweetened. Do I really need to drink sweetened iced tea? It's not necessary. So kind of think of ways where you have unnecessary added sugars that you don't necessarily need, and that's really the place that you want to start because it's more about making a 
good choice, a healthy choice, and about keeping your diet well balanced, and not so much about you know anything that you're doing directly linking to um, you know, causing cancer. Okay, great. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Here's another question. What about canned fish? Is that a viable option? Oh yeah, absolutely. I know that a lot of the um, the discount clubs you can buy um, canned wild canned salmon, um, and that's a great way to kind of fit in wild salmon. The only thing is that if if possible, if you can try to choose a lower sodium version, because obviously anything that's canned is going to come along with additional sodium. So if at all possible, um, canned fish is an option, but try to choose the lower sodium version. If you are going to choose something like tuna. Um, try to choose something that's in water, packed in water, not in oil, because if it's packed in oil, obviously it's coming along with more calories. And tuna in itself is a particular fish that can have higher content of mercury. So it is known that the lower um, albacore can have more, and the chunk light version can actually have less. So if you're going to choose, um, kind of choose a better version of tuna. It's probably not the preferable one, but that actually can have um, lower mercury content. But all in all, if you're somebody who's trying to fit more fish and you use canned once in a while, I, I don't have a problem with it as long as you're trying to choose a lower sodium option. Um, and it is a viable option in order to fit more fish in your diet. Okay, so several people have uh, questions about what about like a regular supplement like calcium and vitamin D? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, especially for people who may be on anti-estrogen medications after their treatment, specifically um, aromatase inhibitors, are known to decrease bone density. So a lot of times your oncologist will recommend that you take calcium and vitamin D supplement. So as a dietitian, my answer first is obviously to make sure your diet includes good sources first. And your diet is always the best source. So before you jump to taking a supplement, make sure you're inc including good sources of calcium and vitamin D in your diet. It's a little harder to get vitamin D in your diet because there's not as many high sources. Y you can get it from fatty fish, like the ones I mentioned earlier, salmon, tuna. You can get it from fortified foods, obviously dairy. We all know dairy has vitamin D and it's fortified, and a lot of um, other foods are now fortified because it's become so popular. Calcium, a little bit more easy to find in your diet, obviously. Dairy food, cheese, dark, dark, dark leafy greens, yogurts, and so forth. Um, also, a lot of foods are fortified with calcium as well. So we always start with diet, you know, from a nutrition perspective. And then if you're not able to get enough in your diet, obviously discussing with your healthcare team, a supplement, um, you know, is likely necessary. One thing that's important to note with vitamin D especially is that if you're concerned that your levels may not be optimal, definitely discuss it with your physician before choosing a supplement because you don't want to take too much, but you want to take the amount that may be right for you. Because certain people, and, and sometimes what I found in, in the breast cancer patients that I've worked with, a lot of times they may have had deficient levels of vitamin D. So whereas you know, a common supplement dose is, let's say, a 1,000 international units a day. If you're somebody who actually has a deficient level, you may need more than that. Or if you're somebody who, let's say, wants to take two to 3,000 units a day, that may not necessarily be appropriate for you either, because if you have your level tested and you actually have a good, healthy level of vitamin D, you don't need that much. So it's just important not to, you know, Start taking vitamin D without talking to your healthcare team first. Um, and then calcium in general, like I said, good place to start, healthy calcium-rich foods. And then in general, most people will supplement if need be with an additional 500 to 1,000 milligrams of calcium. One thing to take note, if you are someone who's taking a calcium supplement, your body only absorbs about 500 to 600 milligrams at a time. So don't take it all at once space it out throughout the day. And if you're taking a vitamin D supplement that's been prescribed by your, your medical team or recommended by your doctor, take it with a meal because vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin and it's best absorbed with a little bit of dietary fat in the diet. So you don't want to take it on an empty stomach because you might not get the same benefit. So just kind of two important things to note. 
about those who are already taking the supplement. Mm -hmm. So Jessica, we're going to have to wrap, wrap it up in just a moment, but um, several people are asking if you can repeat the website that you spoke of where you can get information on supplements. Sure, and actually we have a resource list that we're going to be emailing to you as well that will list all of um, some very helpful nutrition and cancer related websites. So the website where you can access the natural standard database is meals, M-E-A-L-S, dash to T-O dash heal, H-E-A-L dot com. And you can click on the nutrition resources tab and you'll see a whole host of nutrition resources. Specifically, there's a link on supplements, herbals, and botanicals where you'll find ac the free access to the natural standard database. And just one uh, last comment. People are, are writing in again about the soy question and ER positive breast cancer. And I just wanted to reiterate what Jessica said that, you know, you should really consult your doctor about, yep. about soy and, and follow your doctor's directions regarding soy products. Yes, so always important to have a discussion with your healthcare team. So Jessica, thank you so much for your great presentation. And thank you, everyone, for your participation. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all the questions. We may be able to answer them at, at some point. Um, if you could take some time to complete a short survey at the end and let us know how we're doing, that helps us in future programming. Jessica, thank you so much. You're very welcome. And, and uh, feel free to visit sharecancersupport.org for more information. Thank you all.